Welcome to Association Chat, a podcast devoted to talking about all things associations, nonprofits, and the future for building communities. In a world where there's an association for everything, that gives us a lot to talk about. So let's get started with your host, Kiki Latalian. So what we're doing as Q Career is we're coming at it from the association standpoint. So we aggregate the resources for professional and trade associations into a single location and market career paths to students. We're a free resource for schools and students, which is lovely, um, and the associations are our paying customers. So I just wanted to give you a little overview of who we are and what we do. And we're doing these events around the country. So our last one was in DC. Um, Today is in Alexandria, and then we'll be back here in this area again probably in February and then Chicago and, and LA and, and Boston and New York. But without further ado, I will let Kiki kick it off. All right. So welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Kiki Latalian with Association Chat. Association Chat's been around for 10 years. This is its 10th year. Yeah. Woohoo! Yes. And so, uh, and it's an online magazine, online community. If you've ever seen the hashtag ass in chat and you said, why don't they change that? <laughs> It's uh, been 10 years in running, and um, and so we have these online conversations every week, and often the topic of workforce development and workforce challenges come it comes up. Every single industry is facing a challenge uh, in this way, and so today we are here with Heather Dean, Chief Operating Officer at the National School Boards Association. We're here with Steve DeWitt, who is the Deputy Executive Director at the Association for Career and Technical Education, where we are now. And then John Dyer, Director of Workforce for Workforce and Economic Development. So thank you for being here, everyone. So, and I can't see all of you like this, so I might be doing a little bit of this action as we go along. We'll do the same. Uh, Great, that sounds good. Um, So we hear a lot about the skills gap that is connecting industry and education. However, we have this situation where industry associations are often left out of the discussion. With associations being made of employees and employers, they're able to see around the corner. They're able to see what's coming in a way that no one else can. This gives them an advantage over government or traditional educators. So my first question is, how can industry associations play a larger role in the education to employment pipeline? Ooh, it's a good one. Okay. (laughs) So uh, Heather, you look so excited to be Uh, here today. Let me go ahead and call on you first. Okay, great. I I really want to point out to everyone, um, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, NSBA, in the last year, um, we actually partnered with numerous trade associations to talk about the skills gap. Um, So we created this report in conjunction with some of the big trades like retail manufacturing, um, uh, technology, hotel, um, and to talk about the skills gap because as you know there's a huge um, workforce um, uh, shortage across many many different industries and we kept hearing about this and, and thought we're the National School Boards Association our members uh, represent the group in schools that drive strategy and drive the budget, and no one's approached us to talk about this problem, and we could be a real help in this. So we worked over the last, um, well, I guess it's been a little while, we released this report in April to develop recommendations on how we can engage industry at the local, local level with school districts. And we heard from the trade associations, they don't know how to engage school boards, and the school boards don't know how to engage industry. So we wanted to put together this report to say, here's some some ways that you can engage. And the report really revolves around three er areas, well, really the skills that we want to hone school boards into thinking about, that students are graduating without some really basic skills. Um, You know, I have two high schoolers right now. I'm I'm seeing it in real time. Um, (laughs) And I'll just quickly mention these dependability and reliability, adaptability, trainability, critical thinking, decision making, customer focus, teamwork. Uh, It's not the traditional, you have to be tech savvy. You've got to be able to write. You've got to be able to do need to be able to communicate. But industry is saying, we just want someone to show up on time. We want, you know, eye contact, how to shake hands, how to be customer service oriented, those things. So 
our report really gets into how do you engage industry at the at the local level, um, some programs that they can put in place, like encouraging work-based learning versus, you know, I don't know about any of you, but are your high schoolers in like 10 different clubs so they can put it on their uh, transcript to go to college? That's great, but getting a job actually develops those skills much, much quicker. So some of those um, pro programmatic ideas and um, policies, school boards are the folks that write policy. So instilling policy at their district to also you know, move the needle on, the, on these things. Um, so I encourage you to pick up a copy. We brought lots. I'm not going to go through um, the um, 16 recommendations right now. I could later if you'd like. But um, yeah, we're, we're excited that you know, we're developing this model and, and looking for um, working models of engagement on where industry has partnered with school, school districts. I think you could probably think of culinary schools. The Restaurant uh, Foundation has a ton of culinary schools and they're, they're doing great, great things, but the Manufacturers Association has manufacturing days. Um, that industry is not, I think they call it dark, dank, and dangerous. That is not what manufacturing looks like anymore. So how do you get kids engaged or to understand what those, those um, that trade looks like now. It's highly technical. Um, you have to have um, a, not a bachelor's degree, but certifications and different things. And these are amazing um, career opportunities that are not paying minimum wage. They pay really well. And I think there's a real gap in knowing about these these opportunities. It is I went really way over. No, that. you know what, though? <laughs> no, it's, it's the passion that you feel for the topic. Mm -hmm. It's totally, totally appropriate. Um, right. Yeah, no, I, I think that you're so right. I think that there, obviously, technology is changing things very quickly. Skills churn is a very real issue where the things we learn today, we know that in five years we're probably going to have to learn new skills. And figuring out a way to connect our industry associations and education and the employers who are looking for you know, what they need, the right people to fit into these jobs, is so critical. Um, I asked you to talk a little bit about this, but I didn't give a chance to Steve or John, and I have a feeling, but yeah, you know, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so um, we've had, I think probably all, I speak for my panelists too, co-panelists, is that we've had a lot of trade organizations come to us in the last five to ten years, more so than we have in the past, and they've come in the door, and the, the conversation often starts you're not going to believe this, but we think we have a skills gap or a rising skills challenge on the horizon. And of course, the group came in last week from a different industry saying the same thing. So we know they do have, I think, that ability to look forward and think more than particular businesses sometimes have the ability to. Uh, we've been doing things as well at our association over the course of the last five to ten years. Some include uh, small things like a career pavilion at our conference to bring those employers to talk to our educators directly. Uh, a good example is the International Sign Association, a group that I had not heard of before they walked through our doors. And they have so many sectors from, um, you know, welding, which involves signs, to marketing the signs, etc. And so now we've pull, pulled these uh, trade associations together and are trying to think of how we as an association can leverage all of that work uh, to really address the skills challenge holistically. I think part of the issue is that they're each drawing, trying to pull those students for their particular industry, but we need more students to be thinking about these pathways as well. And we just got some seed money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to hire someone, and we have a number of uh, initiatives that we'll be launching this year. And our, our next summit is this coming December to talk about that issue. Um, the other real quick point I want to make is in career tech ed, where I think you have a lot of the programs that are directly feeding that worker pipeline, maybe not the lawyers and, and doctors as much, but those um, skilled trades. Um, we do have a new bill at the federal level called Perkins 5, or we reference it as Perkins 5 in the CT community. And there are new requirements in that legislation that local educators are going to have to bring those business uh, business people in to meet their to make their own local um, plans as they as they move forward. And states are now in the process of developing their state plans, and th those will be launched this coming spring. So I think you're going to see a lot more activity. I, I know that there's fertile ground with schools. We we speak to educators all the time. Our members are all educators. And they're very interested in making those connections. Um, 
so yeah we'd love to work with you more yeah Good job. And what Steve just described about Perkins is also true with the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which is requiring more and more industry engagement at the local level. And so I think we will see some changes. Uh, I'll give a really brief anecdote to illustrate what it looks like when it works well. We ran a project a couple of years ago called The Right Signals that was focused on credentialing. And Lone Star College got together with the International Association of Drilling Contractors, oil and gas drilling. And they said, let's sit down together, let's map out what all the competencies are, competencies are for someone to have this job. And they were able to, in great detail, list out all the competencies and then share that. So anywhere Lone Star does that training, which is literally around the world, everybody gets the same competencies. The industry association defined the competencies. They're involved in updating them when necessary. And, so, and that isn't a ceiling. That's a floor. Maybe someone locally will need more of a particular skill. But at least everyone's coming out with that same base set of skills and can pursue a job with what's essentially a portable credential. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting to figure out, you know, each industry, each association is going to f have to figure out how are we creating these relationships? How are we working? How are we working with the universities to, to reach the students? And, um, you know, certainly there are a number of different nuances for every industry, but seeing examples of where this can work is, is key. So today's educators have to rethink higher education for this world that's being overturned by technology. Schools have to create these credentials that uh, are going to be focused on skills over traditional degrees. So it's not the same as it used to be. It's not enough to, that you just have the degree, right? You have to also get the skills that allow you to be employable. This requires shorter pathways to new skills. Ta-da, new issues. So how do you see schools adapting to these challenges, Heather? Well, we're not in higher ed, but from a K-12 perspective, um, and this is probably something that you already realize, education as an industry is very, very slow to change. So, you know, there are almost, <laughs> surprise, <Notice that>. um, <laughs> there, I, I don't know if everyone's really grasped this paradigm shift where everyone must go to college, that every good career requires a college degree, that credentials or associate's degrees are are also very successful pathways to a, a wonderful life. Um, so we are, are working on that to really re-educate the education um, industry and especially our members, school board members, that we have to make sure that kids know about the, these other um, career pathways. What What's another, I think it's a challenge, um, school counselors are not the same as they used to be. Right. They're not focused on people's careers anymore. They're they're focused on suicide prevention and drugs and all these other things that kids are coming to school with and there's not funding for career counselors so you know if you as an industry could go into a school and and have a volunteer opportunity through your association to help mentor kids into career pathways i think that would be helpful um, as a resource because every school doesn't have a career counselor any longer well and yeah you so i was looking further down in our like prepared list of questions that we have here. What is it? On average, there is one counselor for 464 mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> I do think the, the counselor community is trying to respond to that. And they themselves say, we don't have enough counselors, obviously. But I have seen the American School Counselor Association just down the street, for instance, uh, award their national award to a career tech counselor a few years ago from an area career tech school. They're integrating more, they're bringing more emphasis to the need. The problem I think is schools today are taxed with a lot of things and mm -hmm. not as many staff sometimes as they need and that, that school counselor gets thrown something administrative that really doesn't fit with their job. But it, you're right, it's a huge problem. And, and I think expanding the number of people within the school that can help with that, mm -hmm. um, and even outside the school, some of our career tech programs have intermediaries that connect the businesses with the education institutions, for instance. So I think new solutions, you're right, are mm -hmm. gonna be required. Um, I'll just add to that two things. One is that I don't think we can forget the role the intermediaries with organizations like 
FCCLA or mm -hmm. Skills USA can play in helping with this, and they do a very important role in that bridge. And the other thing worth paying attention to is that in the current Higher Education Act, which may or may not be reauthorized sometime in our lifetimes, <laughs> but, is, but is apparently going to, a version is imminent in the Senate, uh, there is a provision for short-term Pell. Uh, which would be a big change to have Pell funding available for short-term programs and can mm -hmm. really help move this along. What's that? What's that? It's, they're called non-degree credentials, not short-term programs. Oh. Non-degree credentials. Yes, thank you. Functionally, they're short-term programs in many cases. <laughs> <laughs> but I take your point. Yes. Yeah, and our organization strongly supports that as well as AACC and I, you probably not in that space as much as we are because it's higher ed. But, so, oh, go well, ahead. just to add on, I think the the value of that is that so many students now, the the demographics of students have changed dramatically over the years. People aren't just going to higher ed and then coming out of higher ed and going into the workplace. As you know, we have many people, employees that are coming back into the higher ed space, and they yeah. need that flexibility. They're going to take shorter term programs to move up that career lattice. Well, and that's it. I mean, we talk about reskilling and upskilling, and it's not like, you know, a one and done kind of thing where you have somebody who's going in and, and the student is, there's this projected pathway where once they've gone through school, they're done. Um, we're all having to go back to school, you know, and we're all having to continue to uh, become educated. So that, that, that uh, produces all kinds of new complications and things to, to this discussion. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the fact that there's this stigma around CTE education or these, these career and technical education courses where once upon a time they were kind of looked down upon and even still today there's a stigma that's, that's connected, right? You know, um, and yet when we look, well, I, I hope oh, <laughs> our time is up. That's, that's, a, um, that's and our then, door entry system downstairs. I guess. Yes. <laughs> um, so, but yet when we look at who's making what once they graduate uh, from high school and things, it's it's those 30 million jobs in the United States that do not require a bachelor's degree pay a median earnings of $55,000 or more. Eight years after their expected graduation date, students who focused on career and technical education courses, CTE courses, while in high school, had higher median annual earnings than students who did not focus on CTE. So what can be done, the question is what can be done to help remove the stigma that some still have around the CTE education? Take a piece of that. All right. <laughs> Don't wait till high school to have the conversation with students. Mm -hmm. If you're waiting till high school, it's far too late. We know from research, for example, that girls outperform boys in math and STEM skills till about the third or fourth grade, and then the lines cross and go the opposite way. So if you're waiting till high school, it's way too late. Uh, I worked at a community college that had a policy that by the time a student was ready to enter the community college, they should have been on the campus at least eight times starting in elementary school through various events. I think you start early, you work the parents, you work the guidance counselors, but you don't wait around for somebody else to do the job. It's continuous, it's positive, and it's encouraging. Yeah. I can add a story to that. Uh, it's a great point. The, we. Our Career Tech Center, um, I was visiting Moore Norman Career Tech Center in Moore, Oklahoma, probably about two years ago, and they were telling me about a program they have where the Career <coughs> Tech students, uh, which are students who are part of organizations like FCCLA, were going across the street to the middle school to teach literacy, literacy skills to the students in the middle school. And during those conversations, it was, they were, I'm sure there was some a little, a little promotion here or propaganda, but they were also talking about the programs that they were in and why they were in them. And so we're trying to draw those linkages in middle school and earlier grades so that when school students get up to the high school level, they've already, like you said, got an understanding about what goes on in those courses and may choose to go that pathway. Yeah, I mean, it's so important because, you know, for associations, we see that there are, there are uh, different types of jobs, career paths that exist that you would never know of unless you worked in that particular industry for a while or unless you had that sort of overview of what was even available. And so, 
how can they even know to prepare or look for that, or that, that that even exists, that that's a thing? And by the way, how will they know in five years if those things are still the same? And so it really is this connection of what's available and where can they go for that information regularly? Where can they go back and get that information? Yeah, I think transparent, more transparency to parents and students about what exists is really important. Um, the Build Your Future Foundation, which is led by NCCER, which is a construction curriculum company, they do a great job of this. They've got a website that talks about the industry and the career opportunities for students. And uh, they're one of others as, as well. But I think industries need to be thinking about that messaging. We're also thinking at our association through the coalition I mentioned earlier about how we can convene all of these players to develop more of a messaging campaign. Uh, I think it's going to be more than just a one-shot deal or one group um, activity as well. It's going to have to be um, ongoing. Uh, and a third piece I wanted to mention is the messaging itself. Um, Advanced CTE, which is a, an organization that represents CTE government leaders in each state, they did some work with the Siemens Foundation to research what types of messaging res resonate with students. Career tech ed yeah, doesn't mean a darn thing to people. They don't know what it means. <laughs> yeah. Most people gravitate to vocational, which is what we tried to change 20 years ago because it really connotes kind of just one job as opposed to a career. But what did resonate was skills-based training, real work, learning, those types of uh, nomenclature. So I think we need to do more research as well about what, what types of messaging really resonate. Some of the commercials out now I think are terrific. Um, I, I forget if it was Amico. I can't remember the exact oil company, but they're talking about real world skills in their commercials. Mm -hmm. I think first and first robotics are two programs that do a, do a lot of good in this area as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just going to chime in. You know, the, the parent education I think is the, probably the most important, and you can't wait till high school um, for that that education because oftentimes you know you'll be talking to someone, well, you know, CTE or work based learning. Well, that's great, but not for my kid. Mm -hmm. You right. know, everyone wants their kid to go to college and not you know not thinking about that might not be the right path for that that person they might right. do really well in a different in a different um, sector or pathway or industry or whatever whatever it is but I think the parents are probably the first ones you have to hit up and it's probably in the school's best interest to start educating parents at as yeah. early in ages kindergarten there's almost a PR problem with this idea that Absolutely. anything uh, beneath you know, a white collar sort of job that, that it's sort of beneath everyone, that you're not living up to your potential. And yet, um, white collar doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have something to do with all kinds of different trades. And there are so many jobs that exist um, that can provide such a good living for people that, that people have no idea that they're even available. What about the skills that uh, students need to have in order to get some of these jobs. You know, certainly associations are in the position to know that um, there are certain skills that are going to be necessary for some of these very lucrative jobs that are available to people, but nobody knows exists. And so um, what can be done? You know, do you think associations can help identify the skills needed in careers or provide feedback on skills lacking in recent graduates and I'll throw that to you John. I say not only can they, they must. Mm -hmm. um, so at community colleges every program typically has an advisory board made up of representatives from industry. That's also true with Perkins funded programs at the mm -hmm. secondary level. Um, and so that's sort of the, the first line of attack. But I would flip the question for a minute and say if I'm, a, if I'm an education provider, whether it's a high school or a or a community college, or for that matter, a four-year, why on earth would I want to produce people for careers if I had no idea whether they were getting the skills they needed to be successful? Right. Um, so I think associations are absolutely critical to it. I think individual employers are critical to it. Sometimes what the message from an association is not the same message as a local employer, so some level of clarity around that 
at least around, as I referenced earlier, the floor for necessary skills, if not the ceiling, mm -hmm. is, is pretty critical to know. Mm. But, it, but it assumes that skills are not a static thing, for, as you say, from year to year, from generation to generation, what one needs to know to be successful in the workplace is going to change. So it's an ongoing conversation, not a one-off. Um, I'd just like to mention the Business Roundtable put together a group of about 28 trade and membership associations uh, called the National Network and to develop that list of skills that's really prevalent across all industries and they came up with 28 um, necessary skills to be successful in life and that's where we started with our report. We narrowed down from 28 because we thought it, we handed this list to a school district and said make sure that every student has these 28 skills, they'd be like, sorry, we're busy. Um, so we narrowed it down to six to hopefully make this manageable that our group of who also participated in that business roundtable group really thought were the most important. So I think it has been done. It should continue to be done. It, it can, as you said, it can't be stagnant. We have to keep uh, evolving as our world evolves, but um, some of them are pretty basic. and. <laughs> Kids are, kids are missing the boat. So um, I think um, Steve mentioned schools are tasked with a lot of things right now and things that parents used to teach their kids that they're not being taught now because both parents are at work or they're not involved for whatever reason. But, you know, some some basic skills are not being taught at, at home and now they're they're asking the schools to teach those those skills like manners and the eye contact and the shaking hands and all of those things. I mean, now you're seeing kindergarten classroom teachers, when kids come into class, they make them look them in the eye, shake their hands, say good morning, this is, you know, starting to incorporate that. But it's not everywhere yet and you know, we still have we have a lot of work to do. I'd like to put a plug in for the career tech student organizations again. I know Sandy Spavone is with the family career and community groups. <laughs> But I'm not kidding you, if you see these kids speak uh, publicly, the speaking skills and the leadership skills that they get through those, uh, what we call co-curricular organizations, or uh, really do enhance what they learn in the classroom. And those organizations span secondary and post-secondary. Mm -hmm. So I think seeking out those type of organizations can really help. Um, the, or, the businesses themselves, I do agree with John also, he mentioned competencies earlier. And the Department of Labor has a website with uh, some of the industry sectors that have done those competency lattices where you can see what skills do I need when I enter the employment sector in this sector and how do I move up. And I think the industries that are spelling that out more clearly are going to be more successful. The Hotel and Lodging Association just did that a few years ago. Um, certainly the, we were talking earlier about the um, oh, I'm sorry, the MSSC. Um, manufacturing mm -hmm. and, and their organizations that did it and it just gives the parent and the student a better understanding of what you need and what credentials you need as well is it a do you need a four-year degree for certain occupations or will a short-term credential work uh, you know what is it that's needed it sounds so, so practical and helpful to have and yet we don't you know what I mean well, like doesn't that sound like a very like we does, should all have that but you know but part of the we, we I'm sorry I, it takes me back to the whole federal versus state rights and we don't have a country where everything is mandated mm -hmm. which creates a lot of innovation which is terrific like industries can think of new businesses and new occupations but there is no way to really quarantine it or pull it all together I guess it, you make a really good point but it, it is a messy system, and you're right. We have to figure out how to make it less uh, or more understandable for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how many association executives are out there thinking, okay, well, I, I know that I have a few things I've heard that I need to do when I go, <laughs> when I get back to work today. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's not just coming up with the roadmaps, though. It's also forging these relationships, which that can be messy, too. Um, and so... You know, how can how can associations better work with, you know, educators? How can associations um, go and create some of these relationships with schools? Uh, what's what's your advice on on building those relationships? Yeah, sure. I'm staring right at you. I don't yes. know. So in our report, we, we list a couple of these recommendations for school boards to uh, engage industry, but I think it's the opposite as well. Industry should be reaching out 
to school districts to see how they can get involved. Um, we were at a, a district in um, Georgia where State Farm had an office in the high school, and they were that involved in the everyday um, intera interactions with students, helping mentor. Um, so, I mean, that's an extreme example. I don't know if you all have time to set up an office in a high school. <laughs> it would be great if you, you could, but uh, these relationships look completely different um, across the board. But I will say, this is anecdotal, but... We were in Indiana um, talking about the report, and an assistant superintendent came up to us and said, you know, colleges are in this school recruiting every day. The military's in this school recruiting every day. Industry is not in here. And then they come to us and say, why are your students not coming to work for us? Well, you have to do your part. You have to be visible to the, the district. Go to career fairs. Get involved in any way that you want. Even a small sponsor, that sign at a sporting event, mm -hmm. those kids are seeing that, you know. Um, so just get involved to start any way that you can and try to make it meaningful and try to get uh, to the point where you do have interactions with the types of students that you're looking for to recruit into your industry. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone yeah. else have other ideas? Well, like I think the advisory council that John mentioned is really important as well. Our programs of study and career tech ed require an advisory council if you're getting any of the federal Perkins funds. And those advisory councils aren't about, hey, I'd like $5,000 to host a party at my <laughs> in my welding class. <laughs> it's really about getting them involved in the curriculum so that they can, the business is going to know best about what the curriculum should provide. The, the educators are going to know how best to pro provide that education to the student. So a good example is the construction in industry a few years ago when they switched from lumber to uh, steel within the framing of houses. Mm. A lot of programs mm -hmm. haven't made that switch until industry got involved in that conversation. And so we need those types of updates. Uh, we need that connection in our programs or we're going to be behind. Um, and if you see some of the cities that have done this very well with business um, Nashville comes to mind, Nashville, Tennessee. They've got a, a whole industry um, advisory group, and I'm sorry, I think it's called Pencil, but I'm not sure if that's correct. I mean, they've got a number of uh, kind of supplementary organizations. They really help to place students in apprenticeships and internship programs. You know, I think you start small at the local level. As a, as a trade association, you can provide that professional development to your members, and we can help with that. Our groups can help about how do you reach out to educators, we have an understanding CTE guide that kind of just lists some of the basic terminology because we know it's very difficult for people who aren't in this space to understand it and that we are slow moving. So um, those are just a few ideas of how you might move forward and then grow bigger as you, as you move into the next step. <laughs> John? I would say one example that comes to mind, Manufacturing Day is a well-established thing now. It's been around for a bunch of years. Manufacturers host students. Uh, they have come to career fairs, all those kinds of things. But there's no reason on earth you couldn't take that model and apply it to other sectors. There's no reason there couldn't be culinary day mm -hmm. or hospitality day or any one of whatever sector you want it from. And you don't have to start at sort of the scale that manufacturing day is at. But I think, I think, I suspect that organizations like, um, the Department of Labor would be very interested in working with associations and helping to put together something like that. I can't speak for the Department of Labor. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it but here first. <laughs> why, on, why on earth wouldn't they be interested right. in working with employer associations on something exactly like that? Is anyone in the room doing something interesting like this right now that you'd like to talk about? So, ooh, I see three hands up. Let me start with you. Um, so for those of you who don't, um, we haven't met. My name is Josie Wolf, and I'm from SkillsUSA, and I work in our Office of Business Partnerships and Development. And one of the things that we started last year that we are continuing this year is called Signing Day. So the same way students at the high school seniors, and we've introduced at the post-secondary level as well this year, sign to play Division One sports or to go to these big league schools, we've introduced a signing day for students going to the skilled trades. Huh. So last year we had Garoppolo, the quarterback for the 49ers. His dad was a career electrician, and they came to one of our schools in San Jose, California, and put on a big event that was picked up by Good Morning America and lots of other organizations. So this year we're continuing that again um, in our five skilled USA regions across the country with a celebrity at each region to help us kind of promote the skilled trades and, you know, to give these students the same kind of publicity and, you know, fun and energy that all these other students are getting for playing sports, for going to these big D1 schools, 
you know, if we're going into college, to share that the skilled trades are just as important as an occupation, just as notable, and we can help pu um, publicize all of that. Again, you go back to the parents. That's a huge thing, is just bringing the skilled trades into the public eye. And so students and parents can see, you know, we have business and industry support. These are great, really well, high paying jobs that our students can enter into and end up with less debt than your traditional four year bachelor's degree. Yeah, I love that. I, thank you for sharing that. So, and that is uh, Josie Wolf Skills USA. Yep. Yes. Okay. Another great career tech student organization. <laughs> I like what I like about when I hear that is that it it there's there is that PR component. There's that changing Absolutely. the messaging that we were talking about earlier that is so critical in reaching the parents and having the conversation change, reframing the whole thing so that people don't think about it as, oh, I'm not good enough to do this one thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, there are other opportunities that are amazing and you just have to, you know, look at what's what's I'm out there. I'm a product there. of CT and Skills USA and, you know, if I had a dollar for every time somebody came to me and said, well, why don't you want to be a doctor? Why don't you want to be a lawyer? Because I wanted to study baking and pastry arts. I did it in high school and college. <laughs> and ended up getting hired by Disney World right out of college. I ended up right. working for the Four Seasons before I came to work for Skills USA to, again, promote these skilled trades because they're great occupations, but we do. We have that PR piece sometimes missing that parents and students and guidance counselors don't see because they're not in there recruiting every day because it's not right. you know, in the public eye the same way college and traditional careers are. Right. And P.S., if we're talking about the one counselor for every 464 students, I mean, how can you possibly know for each student how to guide them in the right direction, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I saw, yes, hand back there. Mine was more a question that um, you alluded to but didn't broach, and I'd love to put it to the panel. But the area you didn't talk about but alluded to was money. Ah. It costs a lot of money to get a credential or a degree. Is money important in this? No. Probably. <laughs> um, but two and four year universities excel at separating young people from their checks, whether it's Perkins or private <laughs> funds, but they have no vested outcome relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so that the ultimate ROI is a job that affords you to repay your student loans which is why more and more young people are questioning the value of degrees. Um, so there are things on the horizon like income sharing agreements and others, but um, an opportunity perhaps for associations and others, but I, I'd love to hear the panelists' ideas, is how do organizations who may help underwrite against future earnings do more of the risk sharing to get young people into their industries because they're helping underwrite the entryways, even against future earnings. Oh, I love that question. Okay, <laughs> panelists, who wants? It? Who loves well, answering it? <laughs> maybe start. Uh, I think that's a great thing, and I think industry is. We've talked a lot about the education side, and that we're slow, and we don't really uh, move quickly enough. But I think industry's got to be there as a partner, and we do need to figure out between our two groups and maybe a third entity, how we can fund things like that. Another great example is teacher externships, getting the teachers into those programs, or industries rather, to see what those changes are. Uh, and I think the investment pays off for an industry down the road. You can't grasp onto that one student and say, we want you to work here when you, I mean, you, that's what you want to happen. But if you look at the Swiss model of apprenticeship, what they have in their country is really much more of a, a collaborative industry-wide um, model where they don't expect those students to necessarily come back to their individual company, but it really benefits the, comp the industry as a whole because they are investing in, that, um, in, in the internships and apprenticeship model in their country. So. I'll just add, I do think apprenticeship is a, is a decent example of what it is that you're talking about. I think we do expect, at least at the community college level, we do expect that uh, employers will make some investments into training for incumbent workers in some cases. It doesn't necessarily address the young person straight out of high school who's looking around for a career. But I think there is a role to play for the associations in promoting investment on the part of employers mm -hmm. in the education of their current workforce and their future workforce. Mm -hmm. Just um, at NSBA, just for our incoming uh, employers, and Jacqueline worked on this uh, with me, 
millennials will be 75% of the workforce by 2025, and they are strapped with debt um, from whatever education they're doing. So we're looking at shifting our benefits from, you, we're not just going to fund your retirement, but we'll help fund your uh, school loan debt. So you can choose, you can put money into your 403B, or we can pay off your student loans. So just another idea. Okay, comment back here. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, my name is Patty Alper. I guess my claim to fame is I've authored a book called Teach to Work. And I'm going to throw a question to you from the other side. I come from a business background. Um, my opening chapter, I've interviewed five Fortune 500 corporations, MasterCard, EY, Pfizer. Um, I talked, this kind of was the inspiration for writing the book, both the conversation with Intel and the conversation with somebody called Tata mm -hmm. Corporation. <laughs> they wanted to create a mentoring model in 10 states, and they wanted to do it in a year. So if you look at this from the company side, I can tell you this, I was just telling you guys, one of the most interesting pieces of my research is companies want a role, but they don't know how to go about getting it. They want their employees to come mentor, be engaged, begin a pathway. They want the millennials on their um, employment docket. So if you were to have, as educators, sort of this opportunity, it's not simple for a company to come find you or integrate. Mm -hmm. And that would be the question I would ask, and that is what I wrote the book for, is an easier pathway for companies who want to be there to access you. It's yeah. not easy for them. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're saying you want them. Well, it's not easy. We, it's you're absolutely right. It's not easy for the educator either. Mm -hmm. uh, one good example. Well, one example. I don't know how well it's working, but I mentioned the NCCER. They have kind of a. This is a very simple thing, but a matchmaking service on their site. Where if you're an industry and you want to uh, volunteer in a school or provide whatever it is, you can put your name on there, and they do the same with the educator side, and they try to connect them. It's kind of clunky, though. Who does that? This is the um, uh, Build Your Future campaign, which is in the construction industry, and right. it's led by NCCER. We're talking in our coalition about what else, what can we do as an association, but as all these industries, how can we help to better connect? Because you're absolutely right. The IBM came to us three or four years ago, and they said, we have all these positions in these three cities, and the best we could do is connect them to educators in those towns, mm -hmm. or in those communities. But I think we have, we don't know yet what the answer is, and we're trying to get there. I think it's, you've put your finger on the problem, which is there's huge disconnects, and we've talked about that. Right. And we're trying to bridge that gap, but we don't, maybe we don't have all the answers yet. Well, there are a, a, really good point. There are a couple of well, things. Well, you have answers. Let well, us yeah, we, there are. <laughs> <laughs> Did Who's, you have best practice? I was going to say, I think that's where interme intermediaries like FCCLA or SkillsUSA really play a role is, so I'm in the Office of Business Partnership and Development, and that is something I work on every single day. As we have associations coming to us, we have corporations coming to us saying, you know, we need students with these skills, you know, how can we get involved? And, you know, that's how we integrate them into their partnerships, whether it's getting them into schools every day, whether it's the career fairs we host at our conferences, whether it's getting them direct contact with our students, judging the competitions, or mentoring, or getting them a spot on local advisory boards. Those are the connections we try to bridge every day because we see the importance of connecting these associations in the classrooms directly with the students and directly with those local educators. Because if I had a dollar for every company, every organization, every association that came to me and said, I have open jobs and I can't find the students to fill right. them, I would need a job. Right. You know, I get that question every single day and I, that's you know where we're really trying to make some strides is exactly, it's hard for educators to reach across to associations and industry, it's hard for industry and associations to always reach across to educators. So we're really trying to help bridge that gap. Can I, like, and I also, I, I think bringing Q Career, like our hosts for today, mm -hmm. like bringing them into the conversation maybe at this point too because you all address a part of this too, like with with what you end up doing in trying to bring people together. And what have you seen are some of the, are there any challenges that we haven't brought up at this point that you see 
you know, preventing the conversation happening between the right parties. Well, I think, you know, to the, this, the trades part of it, the parents are usually a big barrier, right? Mm-hmm. So it is educating them a little bit. You know, but I think, too, getting the students excited. So one thing that we started piloting um, through different, like, you know, um, Skills USA and SCCLA and ACTE classrooms is live streaming a panel of industry experts mm-hmm. um, into the classroom where students can ask questions, right? So kind of gone are the days where someone's going to drive to a classroom, talk about a career. People don't have that time in their day. And also the student may or may not connect with that one person or that one job, right? right. So by bringing the association, so we asked them for a panel, you know, preferably young. Students want to talk to someone. They don't care about someone, what my age is doing. They just don't, you know? And it's also <laughs> not relevant, right? I mean, yeah. My career path, technology has changed so much right. that, you know, they want to know, what am I going to be doing like when, right when I get out of job, right? So one of the ones that we just did this for was AWFS, and we did five classrooms, three in California, one in Nebraska, one in North Carolina. We went through the shop classrooms. And, um, you know, so again, that way we could hit multiple classrooms. We, we ask for not only young people, but diverse, mm-hmm. right? Because, again, like, these classrooms are diverse. You can't put together a panel of white, you know, a panel of white um, people, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, it affects the students will tune out. They just won't listen. So, I mean, diversity is very important. We're also talking about these careers, the age of the person talking about these careers. And, you know, and they're high school students. So one of the questions they asked the panel was, do you make a lot of money? Yeah. The great thing about it being a panel is everyone answered that question differently, right? So that they got to see the industry as a whole and not just one job in that industry. See, right? that, so yeah. everyone was like, one guy, two guys were like, yeah, I do make a lot of money. You know, a lot of person was like, no, well, it depends on what you made about a lot of money, but I built my own house, right? So the students get to see different career paths that these people, you know, that are offered. Well, this actually brings up, oh, did I you have to throw out one yeah. more thought. Yeah. Um, there's one group of intermediary, intermediaries we haven't really talked about. I think it's really critical to this conversation, and that's workforce boards. Uh, and I think workforce boards are a great place for industry associations and industry representatives to play a role either as a member of the board or at least as an influencer on the board because workforce boards control large pots of money. And sometimes, I know this will come as a great shock to you, but effort sometimes follows money. And so um, <laughs> if you want to influence the way people are doing work in a particular region or a particular state, one way to do that is to make sure that the workforce investment dollars are being pushed in that direction. And that's what workforce boards do. And so working with them, I think, is critical. Like that. <clears throat> Maybe bonus bonus points to get tips on better, you know, working better with those workforce boards would be a good idea. Thank you, Kate. I'd like to add um, one of the things that we see, especially in underserved and rural communities. I know FCC has LA has a lot of rural students. Social capital is so important. That's it's yes. Community. That is where I was headed. Yes. Absolutely. I do. I mean, so I was going to say this is a great transition into talking about the students themselves. Now, what we have is that if young people don't get a good first job, they're much less likely to get a good second, third, fourth, and fifth job. So when they're launching their careers, there's this magical alchemy that happens where they have to know the right people, be know the jobs available. The job has to be available. There has to be a hiring need. Um, and so they have to be exposed to ideas. They have to be exposed to industry. So there's all of these things that have to happen for that to take place. And so part of this, this thing that gets them where they need to go is having a better social network. So how can they do that? How can they improve their social capital so that they are able to get these connections and be able to... Um, you know, connect with these opportunities that may not be available if they if they don't. So that's a question that I have really, and and I've kind of assigned the questions I wanted to ask uh, as we've gone along. But this one has a big blank space underneath it because I really think that this is a question that all of us should be looking for answers to. And so I'll I'll pick on John here. FCCLA, Skills USA. <laughs> First, first robotics, all kinds of organizations like that where there are already existing relationships between employers and educational institutions and parents 
I mean, I think I think that's where you start. I, and waiting till community college, I'll speak at the community college level because that's where I work. Waiting till community college is too late. It's got to mm-hmm. start much earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think career fairs and STEM camps and all those activities that you can get a kid in where they get exposed to these ideas are critical. And most of those happen before they even get to college. Hmm. Yeah, um, definitely CTSOs. I think. Uh, We've got to figure out better ways to get the students involved in their community, too, because there's so many opportunities. Once you start to get to know the people in your community, you find out who those business leaders are. You make those connections. Certainly work-based learning, which is a rising um, it, it's a rising discussion topic in the CTE world. It's coming with the new Perkins 5 law. Many states are going to be choosing that work-based learning component. There's going to be um, a new requirement where they choose one of three options and work-based learning is is one of them. So states are thinking about how do we build more of a work-based learning system to get those students out there. Whether it's an apprenticeship or just, you know, going in once a week or having a classroom within a hospital, which exists in some schools, it's finding those best practices and those opportunities to interact with those employers and others in the community. Like it. I think that's an easy answer for a lot of kids who are looking out for themselves or have parents who are looking out for mm-hmm. themselves. But you mentioned, you know, the, the most underserved or the most asked at risk kids are not getting involved in those things. Right. Um, there is a program, Jobs for America's Graduates, that is really focused on those kids and going to into schools and partnering actually with whole states and saying, who are your 10 most at-risk students? And they actually assign an individual counselor to get them through whatever needs they have. If it's counseling, if it's whatever it is, and they follow them into their first year of a job, all the way through the first year of a job. So there's programs out there that are really focused on those really at-risk kids. But you know, I agree with you, all of those resources are great. And you know, the kids who have the wherewithal and are thinking about their future are getting involved in doing those things. But there are other kids who are not they don't have that kind of hope, mm. and they're kind of right. left floundering, and, and we can't afford to let those kids miss the vote either. I mean, 50% of the kids in this country are not getting the education that they need, and what company would say, oh, it's okay if only 50% of our our employer or employees work well or know what they're doing? You know, that, that we can't let that happen, so... Just a little social plug for me because I I don't want to forget about that. You're right. I think we haven't talked about some of the barriers, such as transportation. Yeah. You know, that's a big barrier for some students. They can't get to the job to be able to take that work based learning opportunity. So, what I was referencing is more systemic change that we need to think about within education. And I think beyond education because it can't just be the educators thinking about this, we've got to think collaboratively. And and the Perkins 5 legislation and much of the federal legislation is now trying to pull all of those partners together, which I think is a great move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we're, yeah, yes. So I've been doing a lot of research and talking, and I keep finding this, um, particularly at Arizona State in their education, the Dean of Education is creating a new kind of education model. And they're incorporating, which is something I applaud, what they call community educators, kind of like citizen schools, where there is a role for the community to be part of the education process. That it, so that you're building social capital, you're learning from others who come visit the class, but there's an active, defined role for them to play. So. The idea of education expanding not just one teacher, but others to take on a role is is kind of a nice way to build that in. Thank you, Patty. I'd love to learn more about that model and how it works in practice. I have a I wrote a blog about it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. I'm Marisa Rosso. I'm with Association SEO. When I was with the uh, state procurement officials. Uh, there is a law, if you can believe it, uh, with people who don't want to become state employees. I don't know why that's not a goal in their life, but, but <laughs> that's what it is. Um, so to give you back to Jesus, we partnered with our academic partner, uh, Arizona State, and using their supply, dem- uh, supply chain management program, mm-hmm. we infiltrated, and um, we created an internship program, which then moved on to our other academic partners, and it became quite large. Um, the idea that the supply chain, that the children, 
the students would, um, <laughs> the students would uh, uh, see the, the ideal employment with the state, um, long-term security. And so we really got that going. Um, and I think last year we had, so we have two states, uh, we had probably about 15 interns. But the supply chain uh, dean in Arizona was just so receptive. Um, we could back it up. When I was working with forensic nurses, we're talking about nursing. We're talking about the biggest career. Um, uh, and we had tons of nurses. Forensic nursing is a secondary nurse, so you get your RN first or whatever. Um, and what we found was that when they were getting their RNs, and then it was time for forensic nursing, um, a lot of people were standoffish. You know, you're not worthy. You can't go in there. And um, nurses eat their, their young. And um, we also found now that nurses, the RN is no longer suitable. Everybody has to go back. So these nurses that have been around for 25 years, they're not getting promoted. They need their MSN. Well, they don't even have their BSN. So I find that interesting, and I think it's going to be uh, something to watch and impactful. Is, is nursing going to stay the biggest? Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. I couldn't say yes and to plus up the conversation um, uh, like our author friend here. I just came out of the field having done eight focus groups with young people between 15 and 24 uh, for some work I'm doing in this very field. Um, none of you mentioned reaching young people directly. You all gave institutional answers. If it's not on this, you haven't reached them. And every association in this room most likely has some form of social media, and if you don't get a campaign going, because if you're not reaching your target audience where they are, you're trying to get them to come to you. Guidance counselors don't work. Mm. And the other statistic that goes with the 464 is that their sole criterion for promotion is how many young people they put in four-year colleges. Mm. So we already know that guidance counselors aren't the answer. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got to be reaching young people. These are your target audience. These are your future workers. Figure out what it is you're doing to get information you want in their hands. Now, millennials are one thing. Gen Z is actually going to be a bigger portion of the workforce for much longer because they're slightly younger. They happen to love Instagram, and they happen to love long-form video. Now, I'm not promoting Q career, but <laughs> I do know, for example, because my work involves career media, that career media works, exposing, raising awareness, giving young people. So opportunities for associations, if you want a pipeline of future workers or skills, if you want to get people more aware, the premium on CTE is now $300,000 in an apprenticeship over the course of a lifetime, where the college degree premium is $975. But the cost of getting an apprenticeship is 50% lower. Hmm. So it's only a third as high a premium, but it's 50% lower cost. You do the math on the ROI. I just I urge everybody in this room to reach the young people I'm talking to because none of the solutions I heard here today are going to them. That's your target audience. I'll, piggy, I'll piggyback off that too. So when you when you mentioned Manufacturing Day, you know when you look at the push Manufacturing Day has on social media, right? And when you think about what it real how it really started, it started by like an ad agency I think in, in Tennessee for I don't know if it was for for Nam directly, but I mean it basically started as as an ad campaign, right? And then they started getting all these manufacturers to sign on, and that became this huge thing, you know. That's great for students and the manufacturers and a career day. You know, we're starting to see other associations bond together and form consortiums and do the same thing. Like they want to create their own manufacturing day. And um, one of our clients, ICPI, which is the Interlocking Concrete Pavement Institute, mm -hmm. a lot of an acronym <laughs> <laughs> in this world. Well, you, know, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're looking at starting, an, you know, an Instagram um, campaign that's going to reach both the parents, right, mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. about like these are good paying jobs, and then one for the students, right, getting them excited, right. But it's it is like all about Instagram and like our videos. Just so you guys know. We have 1.7 million views on our YouTube channel. Four videos we've done for associations where young people are, are being interviewed by one of our paid student interns. They found those videos on 
YouTube, not because mm -hmm. like we're branded yet in the student world. They go and search, not on Google, on YouTube mm -hmm. for career terms. Yeah. And that's how they found us. We got 1.7 million views. Yeah. For students, they're looking, they're hungry for this information, you know. And it's broad terms, right? Because again, they don't know what the careers are. It's like nursing career, healthcare career, good paying job, UX internship, right? I mean, that's what they're doing. They're going, they learn everything on YouTube. That's where they, I mean, yeah. you know, as a business owner, one thing, I guess, I'm going to be a little scared. Social media. Right. Yeah. Careers and learning how to make YouTube videos. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this could go on forever. <laughs> I want to thank our wonderful panelists today. Thank you so much for being here, for answering your questions. Well, thanks for listening to Association Chat, produced by Kiki Latalien. For more information on Association Chat, go to associationchat.com.